thing that would motivate me was the idea that there was gold bars in some of these wrecks, and then I might con consider it. Early September, a still and overcast Monday afternoon. The pager sounds for an immediate launch. An immediate launch, there's no um, higher state of urgency. Initial information we had was uh, just two missing divers um, off the South Goodwin Point. All we'd known, they were missing for an hour. They could have been anywhere. Depending on the strength of the tide, they could have drifted over a mile. So let's get briefed and let's get moving as quick as we can. With the two missing divers six miles offshore, getting to them quickly could mean the difference between life and death. So the warmer crew launched the faster of their two boats, the B-Class Atlantic 85. We launched with it about 12 minutes. My concerns at that point, were they going to be easy to find? Would they have hypothermia being in the water so long? Finding people in the water is incredibly difficult. And if they're not wearing a life jacket or something um, high-vis, it's even harder. As the crew speed to location, they radio ashore and are informed that both the Coast Guard helicopter and the Dover lifeboat have also been launched and are inbound. We want to be clear, this is the Coast Guard. Uh, they're full coming, sir. Okay. Can you do us a pick up? I can see them straight over there. I was asking the Coast Guard if we had any updates or first informants, and they said the boat was still on scene where the divers were missing from. Got an update that uh, the dive boat had broken down and that, that called in the missing divers and that they'd been in the water for an hour. 20 minutes after launching, the crew spot the broken down dive boat on the horizon and head towards it to get an update on the missing divers. As we approached the dive boat, the skipper was pointing quite emotionally okay. to keep going. At that point, 1638, the Coast Guard helicopter flew over and said, we, we got eyes on, follow us. They can see so much more than we can because they're so much higher up. When they see something, can either hover or call over radio. So they called over the radio that they spotted them and for us to follow. So that's why we chased them. I can see them straight over there. Straight over there. Okay, that's it. Okay, fast. Get ready to get out of the water. I've locked their heads in the water. Trying to look for people in the water is a very difficult task. If you've got swells, if you've got white horses, you're looking for a needle in a haystack. Over here. All right, just be very gentle. They're hovering over the location. Port side. Very, very gentle approach. They've got these big inflatable devices to help us lock onto them. Try and come around as much as you can to get them. But, but in fact, still, I don't know, 200 yards away, you couldn't see them 50, 60 percent of the time because how the swells were running. So it made the approach very, very difficult. Over here. You're relieved the moment that you can see them, but that, that, that unlocks the next chapter, which is, are they okay? Hey, grab a hand. How you doing? Good. Okay, bring them back down this way. That's it. Hold on to it. Hold on. So, step one was done. However, the task definitely wasn't over. We knew that they got a lot of kit and they could be quite ill. So our main priority was to get them on board as quickly as we could. Are you okay? Are you okay? Are you alright? Okay. James, Vic and Babs grabbed them and then we suddenly realised how heavy they were. Okay, we'll have to see how we get on with that. The divers have three gas cylinders, weighted belts, harnesses, crowbars, axes. Let's get the air off this gentleman first, and then we'll get him in. There we go. Are you free of this now? If I lift it in, or try to. You can float her off. Yeah. Okay. Right, Managed to get both of them their gas cylinders off. Can I have a hand with this? I've got the divers, don't worry. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, you got it. Don't do that. 
Okay. That's it. Okay. With both divers stripped to their bare essentials, the crew prepare to haul them into the lifeboat. Once we started bringing them on the boat, you could tell they were exhausted. They had no fight left. Everyone get an arm in. One, two, three, and go. We had to really heave them in. Ah, how bad? Well done. Got it. Very good. That's it, just stay there for a sec. So once we got the divers on the boat, our helm was quite concerned that they could go into shock or post-rescue collapse, so we decided to keep them on our boat and we'll make best speed to get them to the Coast Guard ground team. The warmer lifeboat rushes the two divers, Ian and Steve, back to nearby Dover lifeboat station. Monitoring them the whole way after their near-death encounter with the notorious Goodwin Sands. I've been diving nearly 40 years, uh, and I've dived many places, Mediterranean, the Caribbean, uh, Mexico, but out of everywhere I dive, the place I enjoy diving the most is Dover. I've had to push the fish aside. I've sat on the end of a wreck, and the vista of fish passing by is magnificent. That's Dover. Uh, uh, in amongst it, there might be a gold bar or two. No two dives are ever the same. The plan that day was for Ian and Steve to dive a hundred-year-old wreck called the Queen, just off the Goodwin Sands. I've dived the Queen many times, but this is probably, this particular day, was probably the clearest I've ever seen it. <laughs> for things to go wrong, it's, it was a shame. Me and Steve jump in, we descend uh, the shot line to the wreck. A shot line is just an anchor line, and it's got three or four boys on the ends. Ian and Steve swam down to the wreck, using the shot line to guide them, then began their individual dives. We had a lovely dive. The visibility was good. I had a good rummage around, and, and I come back and met Steve, but the shot's not there. The shot's disappeared. As the shot line must have snapped or worked loose during their dive, it left them with nothing to hold on to during their ascent, and no way for the dive boat to know their exact location. We've deployed a delayed SMB to the surface, so it marked where we were. An SMB, or surface marker boy, not only shows the dive boat their location, it also has a guide rope to help them back up. Once I got on the surface, Ian said there's no boat, and I looked around, could not see the boat anywhere. It took a little while to work out where the boat was. I estimate the boat was over a mile away, which is very unusual. Uh, and again, that rung alarm bells that the distance between us and the boat was completely wrong. You must know, as it's well down off the field. I was quite relaxed initially, and then time went on. We was calling, we was shouting, we was blowing our whistles. Unbeknown to Ian and Steve, their friend Colin, the boat skipper, could hear them, but was unable to respond to their calls for help. The engine had broken down. I tried to fix the engine and that wasn't being fixed. I could still hear them calling and I couldn't pick them up. 
I was quite helpless then. There was nothing I could do. Yeah. It's the last thing you want is the helm really is not to be able to pick up your divers, especially when they're your friends. That was a concern. I've never shouted so much in my life. <laughs> started to get a little bit anxious and started getting a bit tense across my chest. Having suffered a heart attack during a dive a few years earlier, Steve did his best to remain calm. I don't want to obviously have a heart attack again, so I've sort of taught myself to relax whenever I get tense, any situation. I'm aware that he had the heart attack. So that's always in the back of my mind that Steve needs looking after. So we do our best to look after him. I was looking for the marker boys to see where they would be or to see them on the surface. Uh, I couldn't see anything at the time. <laughs> Having two divers missing is not a good feeling. Steve did concern me because of he had some medical problems and I really wanted to actually act before this situation got any worse. So I put in a mayday to the Coast Guard. We're helpless at that point. There's little else we can do. We've just got to wait. And then all of a sudden a helicopter appeared uh, immediately above and, and the sound was deafening, but we knew what it was. And almost instantly, I could see the warmer lifeboat coming towards us. That's a good feeling. The stress of the situation just lifts instantly. You're now in the hands of others. We knew our ordeal was over. At Dover Lifeboat Station, Ian and Steve were given hot tea and warm blankets, and then released later that evening. Ultimately, we found them as a team uh, with the other assets. We found them very quickly. We extracted them very quickly. You can't really hope for a better outcome than that. The resource put into rescuing us is quite humbling. I joined the crew to help people and save lives. This job was saving two people's lives. Would I be here now if it weren't for them? You know, it's a possibility I wouldn't be. Despite their near-death experience off the Goodwin Sands, Ian and Steve's passion for diving remains undiminished. The risk hasn't put me off diving, no. Um, I can't wait to get back out. You've got to get back on the horse. Yeah. Hasn't put me off diving one iota. My wife, on the other hand, is very much of a different opinion. Although she says I'm not allowed to go diving again, I will be. Once the engine of their boat is fixed, they intend to pick up exactly where they left off. We'll probably do the Queen again and all the local wrecks that we do. I've got two and a half years to go before I'm 80, so I intend to get there and do a dive, probably crack a bottle of champagne when I've done it. <laughs>